Welcome to the second part of Andy Haynes, a two-part lecture on co-benefits, and you will now hear all about co-benefits from transport and from buildings. Thank you very much. Over to you, Andy. And then we come on to the transport sector. I've already mentioned air pollution, but of course there are other health benefits from a more sustainable transport sector. And this slide uh, summarizes some of the issues that we've looked at, um, benefits of active travel from walking and cycling, for example, reduced air pollution, perhaps reduced obesity from um, more physical activity. Um, and um, also we need to take into account the potential of road traffic injuries. So trying to design policies that will also minimize any increased exposure to road traffic danger whilst providing more opportunities for active and healthy uh, travel around cities. And some of the work we've done has shown that you can get substantial health benefits. This slide shows what happens to how, how these translate into reduced uh, costs or reduced costs averted to our National Health Service, the NHS. And this slide just illustrates what would happen if we could get more people walking and cycling in urban areas of England and Wales. Shows you the um, annual expenditure that we could avert. You can see that it doesn't occur immediately, say for a disease like diabetes, which is the blue line. Obviously it takes time to prevent cases of diabetes, so there's a time lag. Um, but over time you could get substantial benefits from conditions like diabetes, reduced risk of dementia, heart disease, uh, stroke, um, and some types of cancer as well. Now the cancers take a lot longer because we believe there's a much longer lag period between increased physical activity and reduced risk of cancer. It also shows uh, at the bottom of the slide that there may be an increase, a slight increased risk in road traffic injuries, but this is outweighed by the benefits of more physical activity, particularly if we talk about um, getting more middle-aged and elderly people active, uh, and also if we talk about implementing safer cycling and, and walking in cities. For example, countries like Holland, they have very high cycling rates with actually low levels um, of physical um, threat or road traffic injuries. So we believe that there are a number of opportunities to develop low emission and healthy cities through policies in energy, um, in green spaces, for example, creating more parks, which can help improve mental health, but also reduce air pollution on the urban heat island and, of course, provide uh, these opportunities for physical uh, activity. We also looked at uh, the built environment in terms of housing, because in many countries, including in the UK, we have large numbers of very inefficient houses. Um, so these houses lose heat, and this slide shows you it's a thermal image of a house. On the left, you can see the orange image is of a house without modern insulation, without modern windows. And on the right, you can see a thermal image of a house which has been modernized. It has modern windows, it has inner wall insulation. And you can see that there's a dramatic difference in the loss of heat. And we've estimated that perhaps around 5,000 deaths a year could be averted. But there's an important message here, because if you just seal up houses and make them more efficient, you could actually increase death rates, because you could get contract more air pollution indoors. Particularly if you've got people smoking, for example, um, or uh, particulate um, air pollution from cooking. So you also need to combine these strategies to make houses more efficient with improved ventilation strategies. And, and it's possible to fit very modern, very, very high efficiency ventilation systems. But if you do that, you can save large amounts of um, greenhouse gas emissions, in this case 55 million tonnes of carbon dioxide um, compared to a 1990 scenario by these uh, retrofitting old houses uh, with, with much more modern insulation and ventilation. And then we also need to build a low carbon, accessible and resilient health system because the health system is also an important contribution uh, to greenhouse gas emissions in the UK. It contributes about 3%. In some other countries it's higher than that. So we need to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in the health system to increase the resilience of the health system to extreme events like floods and heat waves to provide care closer to home through better primary health care, reducing hospital uh, vehicle emissions, for example. We have a lot of staff working for the health system. In the, in the UK, more than a million people work for the health system. And so encouraging them 
to have more sustainable low carbon lifestyles, to use public transport, cycling and walking, and to use locally sourced food and reduce animal product consumption in hospitals um, and other healthcare facilities can make an important contribution to reducing emissions. Some people ask whether it's, is it too expensive to cut these emissions, but we've now found through recent work that actually um, we're not paying the full economic cost of many of these emissions. So the IMF has recently, the International Monetary Fund, for example, its report suggests that um, global energy subsidies amount to about $5 trillion. That's a very large sum of money indeed. Some of that's actually due to um, actual pre-tax subsid direct subsidies. Some of that's because we don't pay the full cost of the fossil fuels that are emitted. So we don't pay the costs of the damage to health or the damage to the climate and the broader environment. And health and other co-benefits can help to offset some of the costs of moving towards a low carbon economy. And the bottom of this slide shows you the costs of mortality of death from outdoor air pollution to uh, some economies. So for example, in the case of China, um, you can see that it's over 10% of the gross domestic product, for example, and different parts of the world, um, really quite substantial uh, costs of uh, the current methods of developing and generating our electricity um, to, the health, to the broader economy, which are not taken into account. So if we start taking these into account, then these costs can um, help offset some of the costs of moving to a more efficient economy with much more renewable energy, and low carbon uh, electricity generation uh, strategies. So overall, this is a kind of positive message, I would say, although we are moving towards a very dangerous time of dangerous climate change. There are many strategies and policies that we can put in place which reduce emissions um, and benefit health, and also, by the way, help to offset some of the costs of moving to a more sustainable economy. So overall, it's, a, I would say, a positive message to public health that we can both reduce the risk of climate change and improve human health by putting in place some of these policies. Thank you very much.